Hello, hello, can you hear me? Well, hi there, fellow game players and BAFTA patrons. I'm uh, Simon Parkin, an author and journalist for uh, The Guardian, who are uh, co-hosting tonight's evening. Uh, before we start, uh, um, an announcement on behalf of BAFTA. Uh, tonight's event is part of BAFTA's year-round program to share the knowledge of industry experts in film, television and games. And you can find out more about BAFTA's public events and online content via www.bafta.org, facebook.com forward slash BAFTA or twitter.com forward slash BAFTA games. Our guest tonight is the creative director of Bioshock, a video game that is both the highest rated first person shooter yet made, and perhaps more importantly, the only first person shooters who uh, successfully combine underage orphan girls, substance abuse, and pipe mania. <laughs> Born in New York in 1966, he had moved to Los Angeles to pursue a career as a Hollywood scriptwriter when he responded to an advertisement for a job at Looking Glass, the studio behind the cyberpunk adventure game System Shock. There he worked on the script and design of Thief the Dark Project, before leaving in 1997 to set up his own studio, Irrational Games. At Irrational, he developed System Shock 2 before beginning work on what would later become Bioshock, a game that demonstrated it was possible for a blockbuster shooter to feature thoughtful mechanics, intricate world building, and a smart, engaging plot. Set within a utopia project turned to dystopian ruin, the underwater world of Bioshock's rapture is one of video gaming's most enduring locales. Now, in 2013, work is finally complete on Bioshock Infinite, another game set within a fallen utopia, this time one found in the heavens, the sky city, Columbia. We all make choices, but in the end, our choices make us, he once wrote. So tonight, we choose to meet with him in the hope that it'll make us all a little more informed about his worlds, and by extension, perhaps ours. Would you kindly give it up for Irrational Games' <laughs> creative director, Ken Levine. So I'm going to be multitasking here, apparently, because the clicker didn't work. So if I like stumble over myself, forgive me. Um, so thanks for coming. This is really lovely to come to London and have all, see all you lovely people coming out. Um, we just we just sort of put the scene together at the last minute, and it's just it's really the highlight of my trip. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, the mission of Irrational Games, and and in particular how that's come to where we are now with, um, with Bioshock Infinite. Here we go. <laughs> um, that's me, there you go. Okay, our mission. Um, so we started the company around 16 years ago and we somehow managed to get, for me, the luckiest thing that ever happened. I was a huge fan of this game, System Shock, a huge fan. And at that point when I was playing that game, and I always played video games, I didn't even realize people made games. I just thought they sort of showed up in a box somewhere. And um, I was reading this magazine at the time, a, the, a great magazine that doesn't exist anymore called Next Gen. And um, there was an ad in the back for um, for you know game for game designers. And I'm like, okay, what's, what the hell's a game designer? And I applied for the job. And like a week later, they flew me up there. And like a week later, they hired me. And I found myself in a room with a guy named Doug Church, who is one of the great unsung heroes of video games. He was the guy behind Ultima Underworld. He was the guy behind um, System Shock 1. And he and I got to work together on, on Thief. It's like getting hired in the film industry out of college and getting put in a room with Steven Spielberg in your first week. It was incredible. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. Um, when we started um, Irrational, you know, as I said, we were, a, it was three of us, John Che, Rob Fermier, and myself, and we, one of us had shipped a game. Rob Fermier had shipped a game. He had worked on the original System Shock. And John and I hadn't. And I'm not exactly sure, again, how I lucked out into this, but we managed to make a deal with Looking Glass and EA to develop System Shock 2. And at that point, we really didn't know what we were doing at all. Here I was, president of the company, I was lead designer, and I had never shipped a game. I had worked on Thief, but it hadn't shipped yet. And we were really wondering how we were gonna make this game, because the Dark Engine, which was the engine, same engine that Thief was built on, 
was not really a shooter engine. You know, it didn't compare to the quakes of the time. It, it, was, it was sort of slow and a little clumsy, but it did certain things really well. It did a level of detail really well. So we looked at the engine and we said, okay, well, it's not gonna run very fast, but it does a lot of detail. Well, what if we combined, you know, shooting and RPG and we really focused on story? And we sort of, so because of that limitation, we sort of stumbled into um, Irrational Games' mission. And, and, and that mission has been to bring players, not, to turn players not into an observer of narrative, but a participant in narrative. Generally, especially at that time, if you guys remember, do you remember all the, the full motion video games where they had, and that was supposed to be the big Hollywood thing? That's probably why they hired me, because I had worked as a screenwriter. I always hated those games, so I was really excited to say, how can we combine these two? How can we make the player participate in the story without pushing them back and making them observers? Um, and System Shock 2 was our, our, our first attempt at it. And um, one of the key things here is that we wanted to make the player be able to interact with characters, but our tools were really, really limited. And you know, at, at that point, they were practically non-existent. They had innovated this notion of these radio messages and these audio logs in the first System Shock game. A guy named Austin Grossman brilliantly came up with that concept. And um, we had inherited this character, Shodan, who's just great. And uh, when we got the rights to make System Shock 2, I knew that I was gonna put you know, all, all the money on Shodan as a character. And, but I started thinking about how could you sort of make a dialogue between the player and Shodan, is that possible? And I didn't want dialogue trees or any of those old traditional things. And so we started thinking of um, ways we can sort of have that very sort of early stages of interaction with a character. Let me just show you a, a moment here and um, from System Shock 2. Do not presume to go in there, insect. Proceed to the umbilical immediately. So um, a very smart journalist, this is a, this is a moment where basically you're, you have a quest and you want to meet your contact, this woman Delacroix. Actually, she was called Delacroix in the game because I actually didn't know how to pronounce Delacroix, but people told me afterwards, so there you go. Um, this is why I do so well in France. The, um, so you, you sort of have this, you, you get to this moment, you have a decision to make. Are you going to listen to her? Are you going to go into that room? And, um, a journalist who I was, uh, uh, became a very big fan of, is now a comic book writer, who's actually in this room, Kieran Gillen, um, wrote a piece on this moment. Uh, well, he wrote a piece on Shodan in general. And he wrote a piece on this moment, and I'd rather have him describe it. He said, and you pause, standing on the threshold. Whatever will she do? Whatever can she do? If you go in, swearing under your breath at this tyrant, you'll find Delacroix dead, and her final log describing Shodan's betrayal. It's cut off as Shodan interrupts. She says, I hope you enjoyed your little rebellion, irritant. She states coldly, calm, but remember what Shodan gives, she's more than able to take away. And then she strips you from cyber modules, basically experience points that she had just given you. She gave them, she gets pissed off at you, she takes them away. And if you, but if you do what she says and you don't go in the room, and the reason she doesn't want you to go in a room is the person who had your job before is dead at her hand in there, and she doesn't want you to know what a, what a son of a bitch she is. So if you do what she says, she gives you a reward, and she says you're a remarkable example of a pathetic species, which is Shodan's way of sweet talking. Um, so you know, that was really our first sort of stab at could you start really interacting with characters and without pausing, without cutscenes, without any kind of dialogue tree. Um, so, a number of years pass, as you guys know, and after much trying and much effort, we managed to get somebody to pay us to make a game about a failed underwater objectivist utopia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, frankly, I was, I was like, you were going to pay us to do that, because I, 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 I did not think this game was going to be successful. I was excited about it, I was thrilled about it. but. As they started paying us, and as they started offering us more money to make it because they got some confidence, we started getting more ambitious with this notion of, because um, originally it was going to be very much a system shock game with not a lot of 
changes to it. But we just, we just, as we started getting more resources, we started thinking about other ways we could bring the gamer into the story. And you know, one of them was obviously the world. The graphics had evolved to the point where we could really start telling story in the world. You know, you watch the woman with the with the, you know the woman singing to the dead bit to the to the baby carriage, and she's got the gun in there, and all the like little you know all the little mise en scene, all those little visual moments you see. But we also wanted the player to connect emotionally. Now, audio logs have always been really good for that, but they were have a sort of an old tried and true method. Could you connect with an actual living AI in an emotional way? And we thought we had this whole concept that was originally highly conceptual about protectors and the protected and, the, and predators. And out of that, and that was, I, I got that idea from watching a nature show, actually. And I thought, well, those would be really good AIs because when you watch a nature show, you don't, nobody needs to explain to you what those relationships are. You can sort of intrinsically figure them out. And, and those, over much time, evolved to you know, the splicers and the big daddy and the little sister. And you know, the, the roles are obvious. Um, but the goal here was, is could we make the player feel an emotional connection to these characters. And the, let's just um, let's take a look at this one moment here. So these two had a relationship, and it was a relationship that I think people could relate to. I think it's a relationship that you know, I think you see an echo of when you go to, a, you know, some kind of, to, to a, a gaming con, and you see fathers and daughters <laughs> cosplaying them. And you know, to me, this is one of my favorite things, because as weird and screwed up as that big daddy little sister relationship is, there's something there that people can connect to. There's some, there's some, um, there's an affection between the two. And in a first person shooter, you're generally not used to seeing affection. And uh, so we were, I think, you know, to me, it was really the heart and soul of that game. And when people talk to me, a lot of times people talk to me um, about, when they talk about the new game, they say, well, what's, who's the new big daddy? Is it the songbird? Is it, is it the handyman? And I, I, the answer, I think, is kind of counterintuitive, but I think it's also very natural. The, the inheritor of the mantle of, of the Big Daddy and Little Sister is not a monster, because that's not what made the Big Daddy that interesting. You know, to me, the, the inheritor is her, is Elizabeth. Because this, this is a game, we're taking our next step as a rational to bring the player into the narrative experience, and most importantly, where they were an observer of that experience with the Big Daddy and Little Sister, the goal here is to make them a participant of that experience. Now, Elizabeth is complicated. Um, and I don't mean that personality-wise. I mean, she's a co she was an incredibly complicated entity to create. And even so, we, at the studio, we call her Liz. And she's, she's never called that in the game. And the reason we do that is because we've all grown to love her in a way. And that's because despite many, many months of walking into walls and falling through the, falling through the ground and doing the wrong things, and standing too close or standing too far, her eyes crossing, or all these like horrible things that can happen. Um, she's really, you know, she, we, she's always been the heart, uh, the heart of this game. Um, let's see. Rated M for mature. This is a little trailer about her. See the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. Who are you? My name is DeWitt. Come to get you out of here. Do to them. You 
right now. Good. I can get you out of here. You have to leave my land straight. I punish that and I punish We are going to find the Comstock. I will stop him. This will end in the So I want to talk a little bit about what, it went, what went into creating her. Um, the same kind of thing happened on Bioshock 1. Bef before I actually get into the details of that, let me just say that you know how there's the most requested feature in games? The most requested cut feature in this game from our team has been Elizabeth. In Bioshock 1, the most requested cut feature as we're working on the game was Big Daddy. And that's because generally when you're doing something that really sort of there's not a lot of real precedent for. People don't know what to do with it. So when we were starting working on the game, I'd be doing level reviews and I'd say, um, you know, we, we go, Booker would be playing through, we, we'd be seeing Booker doing his adventures and doing all his daring do, and I'd say, where's Elizabeth? And they would, people would literally say, oh, she's in the closet like six rooms back. And because people didn't know what a, a companion AI who didn't just exist in a scripted format, but existed in sort of this combination of a script and combination of emergent behaviors and combinations of the activities she can do in certain rooms, but maybe and maybe not, and maybe she'll do it later, and all these other things that went into her. It was very scary for the team. Um, so I'm gonna sort of try to break her down and what went into making her. And um, we had a, a, lot of, a lot of very brilliant people. It's a whole, you know, it really took a village to make her, but let's go on down to the individual parts. So um, the first part we talk about is human 101. And let's talk about how, how do you simulate a human? Now in most games, when you deal with um, AIs, they're actually shooting you. And actually that makes your life a lot simpler because A, you're usually ducking for cover and things are exploding around you. And your attention is drawn away. And I had a great conversation once with, um, we do this podcast where we interview people, and I did an interview with Guillermo del Toro, um, who did, directed Pan's Labyrinth and the, the Hellboy movies, and he said, um, and I won't try to do his accent, but he said that a great monster, I just tried to do the accent, um, <laughs> a great monster is a monster you can imagine in repose. And what he meant by that is, you can see, like, not just when they're screaming and yelling and attacking you. You know, it's, it's one you can see just in, in their space. I think of the moment, like in Lord of the Rings, when Gollum is, you know, in that well and he's like trying to kill that fish and, you know, and you just sort of see him singing and playing. And it's such a great moment because he's, he's, just, he's just sort of living in his own space and that makes him real. So with Elizabeth, we knew that the, the actual parts, there's sort of three parts of her. There's the actual scripted parts, which are, you know, we know there's something's going to happen. We know exactly how it's going to happen. That's actually a very small percentage of her time. And then there's the combat parts, which was pretty complicated, but at least we know people would be shooting at you so we could have a little more leniency there. The hardest part is actually was that just like the hanging out part, like when you were walking around the world, when you were exploring, because in a scripted game or in a movie, like. Actors come with software, right? An actor, if you hire an actor and you say, hey, like, you know, Ken, you're an actor, go walk around the desk and look at things and, and, and you know, check things out. You know, I just sort of know how to do that. You know, I know how to pick glasses up and I just sort of know what, what humans do. I know how to turn my head. I know not to cross my eyes. And I know, I know those basic things. But Elizabeth didn't know any of that. Um, so let's see what the next slide here is. Um, for instance, what is Elizabeth gonna be interested in you know, when she walks around the world? So we had to, the designers and the AI people basically had to develop this system where they would tag things. And so this is a painting of Lady Comstock, who's a somewhat important character in the game on the left. And that's what the gamer sees. 
Now, if you imagine the matrix, you know, remember when Neo sees all the numbers and stuff at the end when he's getting all, you know, Keanu-y? Um, uh, this is more what Elizabeth sees in the sense that you see all those little eyeballs. That's the designers, um, um, John Abercrombie and, and Amanda um, Jeffries and her team basically saying, Elizabeth, this is interesting to you. Pay attention to this. We really want you to see this. And all, if you go into the editor, all the objects in the world have some, well, most of the objects have some number of these. But there's also a bunch of sort of math that says, well, if you've just looked at a picture a little while ago, maybe you're not going to be as interested in this. Or if somebody's shooting at you or if Booker decides to run to the other room, well, guess what? Don't sit there and, and, like, and be mad because he ran off. But you actually have to go with him because at the end of the day, we want the player driving the experience. But Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth th these kind of things sort of allow us as designers to ex give her a personality, ex have her express her interests. Um, but that doesn't really work without um, some content. And content's really critical. So I'm going to show you some, um, a very early thing here, which is this is Elizabeth is always in some emotional state, and I don't mean that as a sexist thing. She she's always has either she's happy, she's sad, she's angry. We, she, we always know where her state is, and that state is generally dependent upon either script things, like, you know, I wrote a scene where something terrible happens or something funny happens, and we give her, put her in a state, or they could be related, they could related to more emergent things, like a combat happening. Um, so if you look at this, you know, this is just a little video that our, um, animation director put together to show you just some of the animations for various states. And this is what she'll, yeah, <laughs> some of them look a little weird when she's just standing there. Um, and these also tie into um, uh, vocal states too. So I'd have, we'd have to record lines for her in many of these states. So I'd, we'd write a line and then we keep realizing, oh mate, what, what if she's, what if she's mad? Oh, God, we've got to go record another version of that line. And our actress, Courtney Draper, was very generous um, with her time. And it, because if we had a moment where, like, she's standing on top of a pile of dead bodies, and you say to her, oh, hey, um, Liz, can you open that door for me? And she's, <laughs> I didn't see this part. Um, <laughs> And you say, can you open that door for me? And she goes over there like, no, sure thing. Here you go, Booker. It's gonna feel, it feels really weird. And you get that wrong once in the game. And reviewers, I'm not saying we never will get it wrong, so don't hold me to that. Um, if you get it wrong once, um, it really can take you out of it. You know, anytime you look at Elizabeth and she's doing one of those companion AI things like this, or she's acting inappropriately, you really start to distance yourself from her. And that's something we had to be very careful about. Um, all right, so let's talk about her combat behavior for a second. So we, when we showed Elizabeth at E3 in 2011, we got a really good response to her. But something that occurred to us is that she really only existed in the narrative space, and she existed um, in a combat in a very limited way, in a, well, a part, somewhat limited way, opening these tears. We, we really started, and combat, we're not just talking about combat behavior, we're talking about general behaviors. We said, what Elizabeth, our goal is to have Elizabeth be your partner, so let's not just have that be something we say. Let's, what, are the, what ways can she, can she help you? What things can she do that Booker can't do um, to help her, her make her useful in the world? To make, because I think honestly, what makes you like people? And we wanted people to like Elizabeth. I could write her nice and funny and smart and all that. But some people who help you out, you tend to grow an affection for. And so we thought about this. We said, well, what ways can Elizabeth help you? We didn't want to turn her into a gun turret. We, didn't, you know, we never wanted to have her shoot. Because then she's just you know, kill stealing from you. And that's just not who she is. That doesn't make her interesting. So we started thinking of other things um, that she could do. So let's see. So she's your partner in combat. There you go. Right there at the shop. What do you ask me to do? Let's not discuss it. No. What did that thing do to you? Actually, I'm gonna, I got ahead of myself there for a second. Um, so the first thing we'll see is, is her, we decided that she could be, she, she was stuck in this tower for years, you know, for 15 years of her life. And one of the sort of tropes we have is that she was like the little nerd girl of 1912, that she was had all these books and all this book learning. And you actually see, you see all that stuff when, when you sort of first encounter her. 
And we wanted to make that not just a story beat. We wanted to make that relevant to the experience. We wanted to make this girl seem smart and make it seem capable, like she was doing something that whole time, that she took something out of the experience. So one thing we had her, so we came up with ideas like she could pick locks, she could break codes for you. Um, she knew a lot about the history of the city. She could point things out to you. And this is um, you know, a moment of her picking a lock. And we also sometimes use these moments to um, tell a little story. That's the wrong way. Right there at the shop, what you asked me to do. Let's not discuss it. No, what did that thing do to you? If he were to take me back, that's death, Mr. DeWitt. Or something so like it, I cannot tell the difference. Thanks. So those are just two small things she does, but you know she ca she calls out enemies um, who are behind you. She opens tears. She throws you ammo. She throws you health. She's just always trying to be helpful in any way she can be, and that was um, and I think that really helps with you know with the player's attachment to her. Let's see. Oop. Am I going the wrong way? There we go. Wrong way, Levine. <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about environmental interactions. So we talked about the sort of the downtimes. The you know what is Elizabeth going to do? Um, you know when you're standing in a room and the players you know listening to an audio log or thinking about what he's going to do next, she has to feel engaged in the world. People around you, everybody's engaged in the world. Nobody sort of sits there like this. And that's really, really difficult. And that goes back to the sort of the, the you know, the, um, that painting I showed you. Um, wait, there we go. I really am good at this. Okay, so here's a video, a very early video of just showing, of playing around with, having Liz just dynamically go up to things in the world that she finds interesting and do interactions with them. Um, and these are some of the first tests. And she's in a certain emotional state there as well, because she approaches his body. And these are things we don't know if they're going to happen necessarily. They, they can happen, and they can, and they all sort of add up to a, to a larger picture of somebody who just seems that they're engaged in the world, and they actually um, you know, care what's going on around them. Okay, um, the down button is the right button to hit. Um, so let's talk about, you know, I talked about all the people who came together to make Elizabeth. Um, let me just sort of briefly list them. There are the AI people. There are the rendering people. There's the, 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 the concept art people. There are the writers. There's the director. Um, there's me. Um, there's the designers who place all, all the stuff in the world. There's the AI team. There's all these people, but there's also Elizabeth is not sort of one woman, you know, doing a performance like you would in a film. She's actually a combination of women. For instance, um, we have her. Her voice was done by an actress named Courtney Draper, who who was wonderful. And I want to show you some of the extent that Courtney would go to to sort of get this character right. Um, this is a, actually this. So this is a moment some of you may have seen, but this is a moment where we had to bring Elizabeth to a very dark place. And uh, have any of you here ever worked with actors? Any actors? Yeah. Um, there's different kinds of actors. There's some actors who can go places and some actors who can't go places. There are some actors who can go places, but if you take them to that place and that's a really dark place, you might as well you know, call lunch because the rest of the day is shot. Um, one of the great things about Courtney is you could take, in a, in a session, we'd have to do 50 million things, and we'd have to do them um, this kind of emotion, that kind of emotion. I'd say, oh yeah, by the way, the player may be 50 feet away from you, so can you say that line, but as if you're shouting to them 50 feet away? And this would go on and on and on and on, but each time, uh, Courtney can come back and, and perform and then pick up right where she left off. So this was an exercise we were doing, and I come across like a real asshole, so, you know, it's nothing like me at all. Um, <laughs> But you can hear my voice and you can hear Troy Baker, who plays Booker, 
and you could hear Courtney's voice, and they were on opposite sides of a glass booth from each other, and that's how we did all the recording sessions, is Troy would be sitting there, there'd be a glass um, window, and so, th so we could record them without the sound um, stepping on top of each other. And we were working with her to get her to this one line. And I had this idea, which is a lot of actors, this would have been poison to a lot of actors, but Courtney was up for it, and um, we'll show you how we got to this emotional place. I'm thinking, just <laughs> Have you berated you a bit? Mm -hmm. Berated you? Mm. Yeah, sure. What you know? What were you doing? What were you thinking? Like, you yeah, the work. You're gonna get us fucking killed. Like that. Keep going. Yeah, uh, don't be afraid of it. No, 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 I'm not. Really good into her. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Fucking child. Shut up. Then Gary Glenn Ross and beat it up. It seems so uncomfortable. Keep it. I don't care if you're uncomfortable or not. Pull it the fuck together. You've either got this or you don't. The fuck were you thinking? <laughs> Keep out of her, Keep out of her. No, she's got it. She's need to fucking focus. Don't fucking laugh. Okay, you were right. I can't control it. It's, it's not possible. What I've seen lately, I wouldn't put a nickel on what's possible. Now come on. I think it's time we found Comstock, okay? Can you do it once more? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I'm gonna be fucking psychopath. I'm screaming at me a little more. <laughs> uh, that's an you know incredibly rare thing in an actor to be able to go to that kind of place and then say, let's do it again, because um that was great. And you notice one of my favorite moments in that is, and this is one of the great things about working with the right actors, is I, t I tell Troy to keep at her at one point. And Troy, being an actor, knew, no, 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 she's ready, she's there. We don't need anymore. And that was a great, uh, the, that was a moment of the kind of working relationship I had with them where, you know, we all trusted each other so much that I didn't need to be the director. He got to be, he, was, he stepped in as the director at that moment. He was completely right. So let's talk about um, the motion capture actress. Now, so the way, we do, the way this worked is we had this wonderful woman, Heather Gordon, and Sean Robertson, her animation director, worked with her. And um, there was a lot, when you meet Elizabeth, and you'll see some of this in a minute, um, she, she's a kind of, a, well, you can see from her, her physical features, there's sort of an idealized nature to her. That, you know, she has very large eyes. And the reason her eyes are so large is because we wanted her emotions to register at a great distance because we weren't doing cutscenes, A lot of times her scenes would play when we didn't know how far away the player was. So, um, but she also had to move in a certain way. I mean, there's a lot of Rapunzel in the beginning of her story. It gets much darker later. But we needed an actor. Not every actor knows how to move, like sort of the Disney princess. And it can be very, very tricky, which requires a lot of control. Um, and we're gonna show you sort of a sequence that this dancing sequence we have in the game and we'll show you sort of the many stages it went through and, um, and you'll see some things in here like creepy Elizabeth eyes and bad outfits and bad hair and a lot of things along the way as it gets, to its, as it gets towards its final stages you've seen in the game. Uh, by the way, Heather had to work with, she, we would record Courtney and then Heather afterwards would sort of have to act to the voice track and that's not easy to do. And get, get the timing right, get the movement right, get everything right. So let, let me show you a bit of that. Creepy eyes. There. That's where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can... No, let's go! Come on, let's go! Come on, let's go right now! Hey, there. where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can... No, let's go! Come on, let's go! Come on, let's go right now! All right, so I'm going to show you... Um, there's a sequence when you first... When you first... There's a moment, and this is a bit spoilery, but it's not that spoilery. 
Um, oh no, I see a lot of unhappy faces. Um, <laughs> it, it's important if for the purpose of this conversation. There's, when you first meet Liz, it's in a fairly, um, Elizabeth, there's a, it's a sequence, which is, uh, which to be fair, is, is traditionally scripted. This is the part when you meet her, when you, when you get in touch with her, where she, she's really completely emergent. And she's basically pulling upon a ton of content we've created, but he's being driven by the player's cues, not by her own cues. And we'll start with um, this dance moment and take it from there. And this is really, this is the beach where all the blood was spilled on the irrational team. This is where we kept working on her and working on her and working on her until she just, she, it was, it was, it was a pain, it's painful just to watch for me, but it was, once we had her working here, we knew we can get her working in the rest of the game. So let me just show you a little bit of it. Miss. 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 Miss Elizabeth. Hello. Oh, this is wonderful. Well, come dance with me, Mr. Dick. I don't dance. Come on, let's go. Why? What could be better than this? Well, how about Paris? Paris? How? where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can... Let's go! Come on, let's go! Come on, let's go right now! So here she's out of a script now, and she's on her own. It's hard to believe, but it's true, isn't it? Oh, can you smell that? I've never smelled anything like that before, have you? Beaches I know don't smell much like that. because the player is hanging out here, she sees an opportunity and takes it to go to do this activity. Do you know this artificial beach was built in only six months? And how do you know that? From one of the books I threw at you. They also search passing well for reading. decides he doesn't want to do one more, so he walks away. Jump! 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 Down the toes! Look at him. He's got the brains of a child. Twist! Run! You say, take care of this. <gasps> Wilma! Well, it's that or the shame on your family. <laughs> damned if you do and damned if you don't. You have to go. <laughs> yes. oh, I don't love her anymore. It's just a set of lies. Oh, no, 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 So imagine our feeling when you see a player who just picks up the controller and just runs right to the door, <laughs> which, <laughs> which happens. Um, but the, the game works that way. And, you know, and we, we, we always feel it irrational that 
<laughs> the power of seeing something that you feel you found on your own versus something that's forced upon you is, is what makes, this, what makes the games we do a little different because you are, you're a participant. Nobody's forcing the narrative on you. It's up to you to seek it out and find it. And some people rush to the beach and some people spend an hour there. And that's, you just have to be willing to let that go to, to be successful with this model. Um, that was a bit of a long presentation. I, thank you for, for, for your patience. And um, I guess we're gonna do a little, a little Q&A now. So, uh, I mean, you've been doing a lot of press this last kind of four months, uh, something like that. So, I mean, I'm seeing all kinds of articles everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you've come straight off crunch for a game you've been making for four or five years. Um, I mean, how are you feeling? You must be... <laughs> are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, what's weird now is like when we used to make games, you'd finish and then a few weeks later the game would come out. And now I finished my work in December, right before we first did the, the, pre the first press tour when we actually did the hands-on. And so I remember driving home that night and realizing that four and a half years of work, I was about to get on the plane to go to LA and that four and a half years of, I was done. Like I was not gonna be going back into the office to work in this game anymore. And it's sort of like quitting and sort of like getting fired and sort of like a, like a mix of all these feelings. And, I don't think I'll really process it until the, <laughs> until the game comes out and the press stuff is done, which is still a couple weeks. Um, but I'm very proud of what we've done. I'm very, and I, you know, you never know how people are gonna react to it, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm deeply in love with this game and, and, and the most important thing to me in the game was getting, you know, if, if, I, if I look back on the game, how I'm gonna judge sort of my personal success mm -hmm. and people, you probably all may feel differently, is you know, are there gonna be moments where the player feels a connection, as Booker, like inhabiting this role, feel a connection to this, to this character? And will you feel any sense of a relationship? Because um, that's, I think that's the space that, if you think about the games industry and about games, and this may just be me, but where I think where we wanna go is, can you interact with people? You know, we're really good at interacting with guns and really, and, and, and I love, look, I love all kinds of games, but can you get to a place where you're interacting with people? And Elizabeth is not a giant, you know, she's not Hal, you know, she's not a complete, um, she's, it's a lot of content that has a lot of smart ways to play and, and doesn't always play in the same way and plays differently. But she really was an experiment and there were times, you know, there were days where we really thought the pillar of our game wasn't gonna happen. And I'm so grateful that, that it did. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to wind the clock back a bit to how you got to this point. Um, you were you grew up in Long Island in the 70s. New Jersey. New Jersey. Same thing. Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, what was that like? Can you paint a picture for me? Um, it was rough. I mean, I was not I was not a popular kid. I, I, I had a speech impediment. Um, I I liked weird things. You know, I liked, you know, games and I like comic books and I liked, and it wasn't, you know, it, I, I find it hysterical when people get, say that there are fake nerd girls now. If there was a girl who had any, shared any interest with me back then, I would have been over the moon. Um, like the fact that we've gotten to a point where people think it's okay to complain about that shows how far nerd culture has come um, because there was, no, there was no nerd culture back then. You know, you used to read like Starlog magazine and, and a couple of other things and you'd wait for movies to come on TV because there were no VCRs and you know, and every year, you know, King Kong would come on or something and you get all excited. <laughs> um, and, but I really, I was, I was literally friendless. Right. And um, when, so these games, you know, video games, Dungeons and Dragons, those became my only, you know, my, my friend. And, um, so what were your formative games then? Well, I started, um, you know, I, originally, it was before there were video games. I, my brother turned me on to these sort of turn-based, hex-based war games, and I used to play it with him until he met girls, and then <laughs> I played it by myself. Um, and I would not meet girls for many years. Um, the, um, and then it was Dungeons and Dragons, um, which I played by myself. Um, 
which is wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, like all the classes. Yeah, yeah. The DM, everything. You know, <laughs> it definitely required some weird psychic maneuvering to do that. Yeah. Um, and um, and then I got. I remember I got my Atari, and um, and I you know I would go to the arcade whenever I could. But when I got my Atari, that's when you know things really yeah. clicked for me because I would just play. You know, whether it's um, Indy 500 or Air Sea Battle or Yars Revenge or um, mm -hmm. Pitfall, that was that was a big one for me. Yeah. Um, and and you know, and that was that was what was available mm -hmm. then. And what, I mean, what did your parents do? What did they think of uh, kind of your your hobby? My, I think they, you know, they're probably like most parents. I don't think they were overly worried about it. I think they they always supported creative things. Like they supported me reading comic books, and they. You know, I'd, I would sit there and I would draw, like, you know, try to recreate the drawings. My mom would be very supportive of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think they never really perceived I would, didn't really see a career ever coming out of it. So I think they wanted, you know, me to put some limits on it. And I was not a great student and I would mm -hmm. not sort of pay a lot of attention in school. Um, but I, I think they were, they, they were generally okay with the notion of, you know, sort mm -hmm. of, Creative stuff. My mom was there, one of those people. For those who are too young to remember, Dungeons and Dragons went through a period that video games sort of go through now, where there were all these things about you know kids were committing suicide. There were all these claims that kids were like committing suicide when they played it. And there was a TV movie with Tom Hanks called uh, Mazes and Monsters, I think, that is about a kid who like went and went crazy and got lost and died in a tunnel or something. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and it was a real, you know, and I'm old enough now to have seen this happen, you know, <coughs> sort of with every sort of, you know, I was too young for the comic thing, but you've seen this happen over and mm -hmm. over again. Whatever the new thing is, it's becomes, it becomes the problem. And so at what point did you kind of get this ambition to become a scriptwriter for, for Hollywood? Um, so I didn't know I could, I didn't know I had any sort of writing ability until um, I was at camp, and I was working, I was at this, sort of this arts camp, and I just went there because my sister went there, and I, I was, I really, you know, didn't know what to do. I played Dungeons, I found some Dungeons and Dragons friends to play with there, so that was good. And, um... Is d, &D art? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, and, um, you know, I was doing, like, theater tech or something, like, sound, and, I'm, and then they had, like, a thing where, they had gonna put on some like, it was like a talent show or something. And I'm like, well, I don't have any talent. Then, so what if I wrote a play, like a short play? And I wrote this play, and I remember the feeling of writing and going into that space where, and it's a very hard feeling to recapture because writing is actually, you know, for people right out there, it's sometimes a very laborious, painful, anxiety-producing process. But I just sat down and I just wrote this play in like three hours. And I remember going to that space of being in that world, and all of a sudden I was like, wow. And then we put it on, and like, people went really nuts over it. And then I started writing more plays, and I kept like, sending them out to these contests and winning awards and stuff. And it was like sort of finding that you have this, you know, like, wow, I can surf. You know, like all of a sudden you found this <laughs> thing that you didn't know you could do. And um, I was working at the summer theater, I, was, I went to college, and I was, there was a summer theater there, and I just had a job as a carpenter there. And that summer was amazing, because um, you, you may or may not know some of these people. Mary McDonald was there, who um, went to do many things, including you know, Battlestar Galactica, and, um, and she won a nominated for Academy Award for Dance of the Wolves, and David Straith Heron, who you've seen a million things, and John Patrick Shanley, and John Robin Bates. There's a lot of sort of people who would become very successful in, in entertainment. And Robbie Bates um, read one of my plays, and he liked it. And he said, and he started talking to me very high level artistically, like, "Well, I, I appreciate the organic quality of your work." And I was like, "Well, how the fuck do I make money doing this?" Um, <laughs> and he said, "Well, I'll send it to my agent." And um, I, you know, sent it to an agent, and they liked the script. And then I was getting flown out to L.A. for like meetings. I was still in college, and. You know, I, I don't know, it was great for me. They, were, they gave me a per diem, I remember. They gave me like $300 to, mm -hmm. to like, as walking around money. And I, I was like, oh, this is the job for me. <laughs> um, so it, I did that until I graduated from college. And then I, I got a job, of, you know, writing a script. And it didn't work out so well. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a very good script to begin with. Um, and I rewrote it, and it, I didn't make it any better. Right, yeah. And I got fired. Mm -hmm. um, and. All of a sudden, all the people, um, I was just talking to somebody, to Alex about this before, all the people who were so nice to me and friendly to me, all of a sudden didn't return my phone calls. And 
I was not, I was too young to be prepared for that. I had no idea that's how it worked. And I just fled, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I couldn't, didn't get another job, and I just sort of became a computer consultant for years. And I um, ended up sort of going off and my, spending my 20s sort of doing not much of anything. Mm -hmm. And so I saw this ad. Okay, so um, by this time though, you were, you know, girls were more <laughs> interested in you. Um, Moderately. I, yeah. yeah. So I, I read a story about how you, your first serious girlfriend you split up with because of Zelda. Is this true? Uh, sort of. Uh, <laughs> Let's say it's true. <laughs> we, we lived together one summer in San Francisco after I graduated from college, but she was still, she was a junior. Yeah. And her, it was her last day in San Francisco, and we were going to be apart for months. And that's the day I got my Nintendo. <laughs> And I put Zelda in, and she wanted to spend time together, and I want to spend time with Zelda. <laughs> so uh. I don't think she took too well to that. Um, and I'm not sure if it directly led to the end, but I don't think it helped. No, right. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I read that story on the internet where people can leave comments, and there was this amazing comment that I need to read you out. He goes, um, He's read about you splitting up because of Zelda. And he goes, I wouldn't know anything about a girlfriend, brackets, never had one, but it would be reasonable to only play Zelda when she's not around. So I'm just passing that on. So, <laughs> you, you have a wife. Did not call my so. wife, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you saw an advertisement for Looking Glass in a games magazine. Uh, what yeah. were you doing reading a games magazine? Oh, I was a gamer. I mean, I've, I've been a gamer. I've always been a gamer. I love games. I, 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 I never lost interest in them. And I just, as I said before, I just never realized that people made them, you know, it never really yeah. occurred to me. Um, or I just sort of, it just never really connected in the same way you don't think about people who make Oreo cookies, you know. Yeah. I'm sorry for the name yeah. Nabisco um, people here. Um, but the, you know, and so I applied for this job and I had loved their games. You know, I played Ultima Underworld, which had a huge impact on me, and System Shock, which had a huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. Um, System Shock, I think, probably was you know the most impactful on me, and you know the fact that I ended up making the sequel is sort of completely disconnected from the fact that it's also like I, that was that was luck I, that it was so impactful on me because of that sh of Shodan and that kind of and the the kind of storytelling that didn't take you into cutscenes, all the audio logs, um, and um, yeah, they, I went up for an interview, and I think they really liked the fact that I had worked in Hollywood like you know ten years before or whatever, because right, yeah. this was the time when they're doing all the full motion videos, and that, that was the time I was like, oh, the future is going to be these full motion video games. Mm. I always hated those kind of games, but I wasn't going to tell them that, <laughs> and um, so they hired me and um, put me to work. So I mean, uh, uh, this is an unfair question, but at that f time, did you feel like games was settling? It was second best for you, or did you very quickly decide, no, this is what I want to do? Oh, I was a, I was a pig in pig manure. Um, you know, I got there, and remember, I had I still at this point didn't really know a lot of gamer or any gamers really, and except for my one my one best friend who was a gamer. But I got there, and all of a sudden, everybody was a gamer. You know, I, I gave a speech at PAX where I described it as finding my tribe. It was it really was feeling like you know, where have these people been. You know, all along, mm -hmm. uh, these people who shared, not just occasional, like occasionally you meet a guy who's like, yeah, yeah, I play, uh, I play Doom, or you know, something like every now and then. You, people who are deeply committed to this, not just gaming, but to the craft of making games, mm -hmm. and all they wanted, you know, they would they would talk about it, and they knew, you know, about everything I knew about, it. and they were also like all these MIT guys, so they're also insanely smart and and, and, and knowledgeable, and and. Um, you know, some of them are quite, you know, odd and acerbic too, but that's, you know, it's game development. And going to Looking Glass was sort of like going to Game de Design University. Like, uh, there's a reason they made some of the greatest games ever, and there's a reason they went out of business, which is right. it really was more like a school. Yeah. And um, I learned, I mean, I just can't, if I didn't, if I hadn't, if I had started another company, you know, who knows where I would have ended up. Mm -hmm. I didn't only start there, but I ended up working with this guy, Doug Church, who was, mm -hmm. you know, just a, is, is a genius. Mm -hmm. So you, you left quite soon after to set up Irrational and worked on System Shock 2. Now normally when someone leaves a company, you don't get to work on their old IP. How did, how did that come about? Yeah, what happened was is, you know, we, 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 it's a good lesson about not burning bridges. You know, yeah. we, we, when we left, what had happened is we were, I was working on a thief game, on the thief game and working on the story and then I was also working on a Star Trek Voyager game with Rob and John, my two co-founders. And the Star Trek game got canned. 
and um, that nothing with half a day with not, basically nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing, you know, that's, if you've ever had a job where you come in and there's nothing for you to do, it's really depressing. It's, re mm -hmm. it's really bad. Um, and so I was getting really depressed and upset. And I thought, looking at Looking Glass, I said, I bet we could, there's a, a model where you can make games like this, but with a little more orientation towards actually, you know, running a, a business. Not that I knew anything about running a business, I never had. And um, I certainly didn't know anything about shipping games because I hadn't shipped a game. <laughs> and so, you know, we decided to leave and start Irrational. And we left on good terms and we knew the, we knew the engine um, which Thief was made on and they wanted to amortize the cost of that engine across multiple titles. Um, and um, you know, when the evening's getting exciting when somebody says amortize the cost of the engine across <laughs> multiple titles. Um, <laughs> and. Um, so they called us, um, Paul Narath called me and he said, hey, do you want to come in and do this? And you know, we had no work at all, you know, and um, we said, sure, and we came in and we pitched this idea and um, EA signed up and, you know, for those who want to know, by the way, people asking about the rights to System Shock, I have no idea. It is like in the weirdest limbo that I have, even I am completely clueless as to figure out what they are, so please stop tweeting me. Um, <laughs> um, you know, EA owned the, I think EA owned the trademark and Looking Glass owned the copyright and now a bank owns the copy or something like that. It's very confusing. But, you know, they managed to, we managed to convince EA to get on board and there we go. Mm -hmm. And then after that game came out, you pitched System Shock, uh, Shock 3 to EA, but uh, that, that didn't, didn't work out. Why was that? Yeah, well, you know, nobody was buying Maser Maseratis after System Shock 2. Right, um, yeah. It did very well critically and... Um, yeah. You know, and so we had a lot of support from people in the gaming press, and that was great. And it put us on the map with the press, and mm -hmm. it put us on the map with certain executives at, certain generally junior executives at publishers. So it really helped us get work again in the future, but you know, I actually wrote a design for System Shock 3, um, which I yeah, had no interest in. Do you still have that? I don't know if I still, I still have it in, a little bit in my head. I don't think I still have the actual document. No, I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just uh, quickly whizzing through uh, onto Bioshock. Um, what problems did you encounter during that game? I mean, that, that was a game where it was seemed like it was like lots of loose components coming together uh, very slowly and difficulty. Is, is that true? Well, it took us a long time to get it set up with a publisher because nobody, you know, nobody in the right mind was going to fund that game. And... Um, the t it was really the team that kept encouraging me to go out and pitch it because most of them probably came to the company to make games like that. And here, th then they came there and then they saw that I had little impetus to go out and pitch a game like that because I just thought I couldn't sell it. Mm -hmm. And that was my job. I had to make payroll every month. I was the, I was the you know, designer guy and the writer guy and the money guy, which is, you know, I don't miss that part of my job. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so they had to convince me, really. And we went out for probably three years pitching that thing. Mm -hmm. And finally, Take Two, um, a woman at, at, uh, at Take Two named Susan Lewis, was enough of a fan and was had enough influence with the the higher management to um, to convince them to to put money behind this. And then when they saw we well, brought it to E3 in 2006, and people saw the reaction, they put more money behind it, and you know we were able to make it really into a I think the game that it, that you know if we didn't have that additional money, I don't think it would have been the same game. Yeah. So, I mean, blockbuster games are always like a, you know, the result of a big group effort and you've always been the, the face of that. Did that kind of create tensions with the team at all? Um, no, I will. so certainly John, well Rob had left after, after System Shock 2 and John, my partner, he never wanted to, uh, he's an incredibly talented guy, he's making a game called Card Hunter now, which everybody should play. It's insanely awesome. John is an incredibly talented guy. Um, he never, he, John's not that kind of guy. He didn't want to be out in front of the press. It's very hard for him now to promote this game he's working on because he's, it's not his natural thing. He's very, very unassuming, but also one of the most brilliant developers I've ever known. Um, so I, it was sort of my job fell to me at the beginning and um, I found I had, you know, a, I, could, I could comfortably communicate about what we were doing. And um, it just sort of fell to me over time. And, we, and now it's become the point where we still, you know, we just, I'm on a press tour right now and we were in, you know, I've been in, I was just in Paris and then Munich and we were in Amsterdam and, and um, Barcelona and, and, 
and Rotterdam and, and Vienna, so it's not just me. We have people like fanning out all over the globe. Yeah. So um, we have quite a number of people promoting the company. Um, and it's, look, it's nice. You know, I definitely probably get credit for more things than I deserve. Um, uh, when things don't go so well, I get all the blame, which is nice too. Um, <laughs> and, but you know, it, somebody's, I think it's important that, that I do take responsibility for what the, ga what the studio does. You mm -hmm. know, if the game's yeah. good, if, if the game's good, I'm, I am part of a very large team and very talented people. But if the game's bad, I think to some degree the buck stops with me because you know, at the end of the day, I have final say on things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, on that last question before I open it up to, to everyone else, but um, I, th I think often with blockbuster games, you see the teams kind of disintegrate after it happens, and especially with your games, I hope, hope you don't mind me saying, that seems to happen. Your kind of teams implode after the game comes out, uh, you know, or, or you, you know, there's a kind of large kind of you yeah. know, moving on. W why do you think that's specific to, well, to these games? We've had some loss in people during Bioshock Infinite. We actually didn't. The reason people left on after Bioshock One is because mm -hmm. the studio wanted to set up another, to take two, wanted to set up another studio. Yeah. So they basically recruited from within Irrational and offered people packages to go to California. So um, I don't think you know. And after System Shock, we didn't really lose anybody. It was really the last year where we probably had a higher, and and even so, I don't know what was our retention rate. It was. 10, and where our turnover was like 10 or 15 percent, it, it got noticed. And I think that if it was 10 years ago when we had a 30 percent retention loss, you know, loss, nobody would even notice. We were under a, we were under a bit of a microscope. And so I, no, I do think we lost more people than we normally would. And I think a lot of it has to do with what I said about the Big Daddy and Elizabeth. I think <coughs> it's scary. You know, there, I remember we lost one guy on Bioshock. And basically, he came to me and he said, Dude, you're, you're locked. Like, this thing is a disaster, and I, I can't stay here. And I was like, well, you know, go with God. Well, you know, what can I say? Mm -hmm. Either you believe in it or you don't. And I think that happens. I think sometimes people get nervous, and they, especially if it's not something, especially people who haven't worked on um, one of these kind of games before. Mm -hmm. You know, the people, you know, there are people at the company who've been with the company since back in the Looking Glass days. You know, the Sean Robertsons, and the Scott Sinclairs, and the Rob Waters, and the Alice Kays. Um, and you know those guys are very comfortable with what goes on because they've sort of been through it before. And Bioshock games are, are really very difficult to make. They're mm -hmm. extremely difficult to make. They're very, because of all the things that make them special, also make them really challenging. Yeah. And the stories come together very late and because we're constantly, I'm constantly as a writer looking for opportunities in the gameplay to make make better better stories, and traditionally, you know, we're we're a very flat hierarchy. We don't have a lot of manager types, and sometimes that can lead to you know things not always going as you hope. But we also have a culture of everybody who works on the game makes things for the game. Mm -hmm. There's nobody who just sits in an office and 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 and, and uh, nobody on the production side sits in the office and just says this is what should happen. You know, I write. Um, you know, John would do design or programming. You know, like there, there's always well, that's a culture we have there. But that that means we're a bit management light, and I think if people come from cult, cult, other cultures. That could be a little unnerving for them. Yeah. So generally, some people came to the title to the project um, not knowing how we worked. I think looked at them and looked came and they, and they looked at us. And said, These guys know what they're doing, and uh, and I think a lot of times it looks like we don't know what we're doing. And I think that's also why the games are good. Yeah. Um, because you know, because we aren't afraid to not know what we're doing, yeah. and um, that can be really scary at times. But that's also when you end up with some surprises. The one game where I think we really, the games that we knew where we really knew what we were doing. I think you know, like Freedom Force was the Third Reich was the sequel we made to Freedom Force, and we knew exactly what we were doing. It was basically an expansion pack, and it didn't do very well because mm -hmm. our lack of effort, our lack of risk showed to the consumer. And I decided that we would never do that again. That's why we didn't do Bioshock, you know, and there's not an aspersion on Bioshock 2. I think the team did a great job with it. But going, it was for us that would have been repeating what we had done in a lot of ways and would have been e easier for us. And that's why we didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, here we are four and a half years later, you know, so mm -hmm. you, this, it's a, you gain some and you lose some. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's see what questions you guys have got. 
And if you just wait for the mic to come to you, it will be on so you don't need to tap it or anything. And, and, and so who you are and what you do? Um, Richard Dennis, uh, just journalist. I'm just curious, you've spoken some about uh, gameplay and narrative and one informing the other. Can you give some examples of where that's sort of come into conflict and which one tends to give first? Well, generally when they're in conflict, that's telling you there's a problem with, you know, with one or the other. That, and I think you have this a lot of times where, um, like I've heard stories of like people who work with writers who um, are heard on the outside, and this is not necessarily the fault of these writers, but um, they, you know, they send over their script you know, there's some guy working, there's a Hollywood writer working, you know, a thousand miles away, and they send over their 300-page script and they say, here's your game. And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons I think our stories are, you know, whatever quality level they have, is because, A, I'm in the studio, and I'm, I get to, I know what's gonna happen if I, if I want to do something on the narrative side, I see the impact. I see the people glaring at me, you know, who, who get upset by that, and vice versa. You know, I know that when, for instance, we had some production problems and um, we decided to do a qu quality over quantity thing, and we cut a level, and I had to restitch. You know, I had already went and recorded, wrote, recorded, da 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 da, da and I had to go take that, all, throw all that work out, and then restitch stuff together. And actually, generally what happens, this usually ends up making a better game when you make cuts. Um, but it was, you know, then I was, I was glaring back at them. And, but that's, that's the process, it's a, it's a negotiation and it, it's gotta be for the bet, for everybody's gotta sort of put their egos aside and say what's best for the game. And that's not, a, that's not always easy to see. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I can, um, with the new game, you're dealing more with uh, religion and racism, and I think that's a very brave move in terms of gaming, modern gaming and stuff like that. It, was there any point during the development that the team kind of felt, whoa, we're kind of going down kind of murky waters with this? No, that's more of an issue in Bioshock 1 with the little, with the little sisters. When I came in and I pitched that idea, of harvesting the little sisters, and I thought it was critical to telling that story, you know, that it would, that to talk about the, you know, capitalism, the extremes of capitalism, to find them, like, the most extreme expression of it. Um, I think people were, got very, very nervous, and um, I actually went to the publisher, um, and I said, look, this is what I want to do, and there's a lot of people at the publisher are nervous, but there was a guy um, at 2K who was, came from a creative background, he said, no, this is the right thing to do. And, um, after that, sort of, I never, the publisher just trusted me to, to make whatever judgments. On this game, um, I was more nervous, like there's some racial content in there, and obviously Irrational is a racially diverse company, and, um, and you know, and we, it's sort of an equal opportunity, it's a, it's a racistly equal opportunity, you know, they're, they, they beat up on, the, the, the founders are happy to, they have a lot of different people they're not crazy about. But I remember sort of looking around at the various faces when the various things came up on the screen with the various stereotypes, and some of the stereotypes are extreme and ugly. And I got nervous, you know? I got a little nervous because those were my colleagues and I didn't want them to feel, you know, you always think, of, are they gonna think this is what I, what I think of them? And I made sure that I included stereotypes of my own race as well in it. Partly because it, it was accurate, but also because, you know, hey, in for a penny, in for a pound, and uh, I've, gotta be, I've gotta be there too. Um, but no, I, I didn't worry about. I don't worry about it from an external point of view because why? Why should games be any different than any other form of media? I think if we're afraid of, and I, I think I think we do it ourselves. I think most of the questions I've gotten about the themes, I'm certainly on Bioshock One. All the questions I got about the concerns about the Little Sisters came from the enthusiast press, not from the mainstream press. And you get a single one from the mainstream press. And I think it's because we're still, we lack confidence as an industry about, and as gamers, I think we lack confidence that we're still not sure what we do. And that's why we look to Roger Ebert to tell us, you know, whether our games are cool or not. And I think that's, that's not a good thing. I think we, we need to sort of say like, well, why can't we take on topic X, topic Y, topic Z? Why are movies, comics, whatever, any different? Um, that's not to say we'll do it well. I mean, you could take on a topic and do it clumsily and ham-fistedly and embarrass yourself and, 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 and anger people. 
but you know, that doesn't mean that the topics are off limit, but you do have a responsibility. And I don't mean an external responsibility. I feel a responsibility when I take these topics on to take them on in a way that I feel tells the story and no more, just tells the story. Just uh, following on for that, I mean, you were telling me beforehand that you've had a number of threats kind of leading up to Bioshock Infinite. Um, what is it that you're saying about America with this game in particular that's kind of inspiring that kind of reaction from white supremacists and people like that? I don't know if any of the threats, like there are, I guess there are some, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I, there's some very negative things said and some racist things said. Um, and, I, and some, there, yeah, there was some people who said some really nasty things and threat, slightly threatening things. But I think that what people see in, in these games is they tend to see a Rorschach of what is, you know, what is their pet thing, and if, and they're very sensitive to it getting insulted. You know, so for instance. Um, you have um, you know, people who are very conservative feel that this, is, this game's an attack on conservatism, which is, strikes me as very strange because if the founders of their, ver their vision of conservatism, I would re-examine their vision of conservatism because I know plenty of perfectly nice conservatives who are nothing like the founders. And then you know, when the Vox Populi were shown, we had some people on the left who were, thought it was an, you know, an attack on labor movements. And, um, and the same with Bioshock 1. There were people who thought it was an, an anti-Rand diatribe and there was people who thought it was, you know, um, cons you know, economic conservative distilled, e economic conservatism distilled. And so I, I like that though. I like the fact that it's hard to pin down, mm -hmm. you know, what, what exactly it is we're criticizing because I don't, polemics are boring. Um, I'd rather ask questions and answer them. Mm -hmm. Um, you said in interviews that one of your main goals of uh, Bioshock Infinite is to try and create a character that players can invest in. Um, now, with the, the inherent agency in video games, players like to feel as though that they can put a part of themselves into the character. So with the first Bioshock, you had a blank canvas where that was possible. Now with Bioshock Infinite, what you've got is a character that has his own name and his own backstory and his own character traits. So basically, what kind of... Uh, challenges that did that present to you in terms of the writing and how did you adapt your writing style to try and make players invest in Booker? That's a really good question. Um, it required a lot of humility as a writer because you want to, when you write, you want to write characters. You want to really fill them out and you know, give them a lot of character. And to some degree, every time you do that with Booker, you're in danger of running into a conflict with the, um, you know, with the person playing him. So, we decided, I decided early on some things about Booker that, for instance, that he was going to be out for himself. That was important because, hey, who, who can't get on board for being out for yourself unless you're a much more nicer person than I am. But every, you know, everybody has that sort of self-interest. Um, he was not a joiner. Um, and maybe that was sort of me. You know, I, never, I was never really a joiner. Um, and maybe some people are. Maybe some of the people who aren't joiners would, would, who are joiners would feel a little uncomfortable with that. He is um, fairly quiet. Uh, he doesn't say, he says what's necessary, and, and generally he says things that are sort of objectively true. Um, you know, I, and he doesn't have any sort of like, if he ever said at any point that like, hey, you know, Elizabeth, I'm really into little boys. Like, I think we have a problem there because, <laughs> you know, that would be hard for most of the population to sign on board with. Um, but on the other hand, with, without him having a character, how can he have a, you know, it's writing any kind of, if he didn't talk, for instance, and if he talks, he has to have a character or he's, you know, a robot, um, the relationship with Elizabeth wouldn't really be possible. But also, I think I wanted to experiment with what that was. How do you write that kind of character? And how, do you, how are you successful? And we had a lot of stumbles along the way, and we did a lot of testing, and a lot of people would, for a long time hated him, and we realized, um, and I want to say what we realized because it's a bit of a spoiler, there are some very simple reasons that people weren't relating to him, and we were closer than we thought, and we made a few tweaks, and all of a sudden, um, people were able to slip into his skin. There was a lack of trust for a while, and we figured out why that was, and then once that trust was established between themselves and Booker, they can fit themselves in this weird role of, 
they're both themselves and they're this character and they're interacting with this woman. And that's a weird, that's an odd place to be, but we wanted to do that experiment. We had done two games where you played a nameless, voiceless cipher and I felt we had kind of done that already. Did you feel like you were compromising though, kind of to pull the character you wanted to write back in order to kind of not put players off to make it more palatable? No, I mean, you, you, if it serves the game, it's not a compromise. It can never, it's never a compromise if it serves the game. Like, mm -hmm. your, own, your own desires to write, like, you know, you know, every time like I found I was writing him where he'd say some smart Indiana Jones-like comment, I would cut it, you know, because that was not, he's not a, I mean, he makes a couple, yeah got a couple. Um, but generally, I pulled him back. And, that, and what I, what I, the, the direction I gave to Troy, um, more than any other direction, is, um, oh my god, now I'm forgetting what the words were. Uh, oh no, my god, I gave this direction all the time. It was, um, I keep, cool your jets keeps coming to my head, but that, I know that wasn't it. Um, it was basically saying, pull it back, pull it back, pull it back. Um, don't invest so much emotion into what you're saying because the more neutral he was in his emotion, the more easier it was for the player to sort of have that feeling rather than the character had that feeling. I mean, do you oh, think drain the swamp. That's what I would say to him. I would okay. say drain, drain the swamp, drain the swamp. And, and, and he, he was great because an actor, and it's not just a writer, an actor wants to perform, right? Yeah, right. So Troy Baker would, came to this part where basically I was saying to him, underperform. And not a lot of actors would be cool with that. And he was really cool with that. And it took a good actor to perform, to, 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 to approach it with that kind of minimalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think, just to pick up on, you know, it's interesting that you said, uh, and we all laughed about making him a paedophile would be too far. But I mean, if you look at other forms of fiction, I forget who said it, but um, there's that quote about the pages of a novel being like the bars of a cage. So you can press your nose against it and look at the tiger and it's safe. Um, do you think that doesn't apply to video games? You know, no, no. I mean, like Sander Cohen is fine because he's not you. You know, so you do it. And there are plenty of characters in these games that you do whatever you. You know, I take them wherever I want to take them. And there are some dark characters in these games. Um, but could you play as them? Is my question. It would be. T I think you could in a third. Playing characters in a third-person game is different than playing them in a first-person game. It is, you know, in, in Uncharted, you sort of are controlling Nathan Drake interacting with people. You are not interacting people directly. That's why you had to be in first person in this game because um, there's a lot of reasons why we do games in first person. One is the kind of detail we put in the world is, you know, the camera's up here in third person and it's much harder to get close up to things. But also, if Elizabeth was talking to that 3D model of Booker, that would be very different than her looking right at you. And you've seen lots of scenes in it where she actually looks right in your eyes. And it's going to be a very powerful, very powerful thing. Yeah, yeah, very quick. Sorry. Uh, hi, my name's Rob, just a, a gamer. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for not putting multiplayer in because that cheapens games that you make. I think, uh, I think multiplayer has got its own function somewhere else. I, I'm, I'm pleased to have failed at making a good multiplayer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted You're to welcome. ask um, your, your, your crazy ideas for your games, um, you know, something in the sky, uh, something under the water, where do they come from? Is it, is it the blue crystal meth from Breaking Bad or <laughs> is it, it, do you just come up with it all of a sudden, like bees coming from your hands and you just think of it straight up or? Um, you kind of, it really is like, you know, waking up and finding that the, you know, that the elves have made the toys, you know, quite often. And he, but it's usually because you've gone through a very, very painful process of lots of frustrating discussions, and you fail, and you fail, and you walk out of those discussions, and then and you work on it for weeks and weeks, and then you're in the shower, and then all of a sudden you go, oh, God, of course. And it comes out of nowhere. But it's, but it's not like easy. It's because you've done all that work of breaking it down um, before. Very rarely do you get like just a great idea right out of the blue. The, the ending of this game took us like four months of talking, and then I wrote in two drafts. Like, like, because we had, because all the talking is where we did all the breaking, breaking it down. And then it was very quick once we sort of had broken it down, and it was, you know, it was a lot of complex things trying to be made into some very, a few very simple things. And, but it was 
painful, painful, painful work until it was right there and easy to do. Um, and sometimes the ideas never, you know, they never come. Sometimes you get stuck with shipping stuff you're not crazy about, and, but, you know, pencils down. Can you give an example? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, I, I mean, I think we can probably fit in a couple more. I agree, but probably in the time I'm going through this. Go on, you do one. Well. Say who you are. Hey, uh, I'm Jack. I'm a games design and kind of writer, uh, student. And um, your games are really important to me because they kind of seem like you write them, but you write them as a game. And it seems like the trend at the moment is for games to become more kind of Hollywood cinematic, you know, non interactive cutscenes, big actors writers coming in from other media which aren't kind of interactive. And I wonder if you, th if you could just talk a little bit more about the process of kind of A, writing for games, and B, whether you think uh, the industry is doing enough to encourage writing for games as its own medium and bringing in kind of writers to write for games, not script writers from films who then come in and write games once they've written two big screenplays or something. So let me just say right off the bat, I have an advantage because I've been president of the company since we started. And so when it comes to allocating resources, I get, a say, I, get the, I get the biggest say in that. So I think writing is important, so I make sure, and I have to balance it against everything, but I, there's a very, you know, the person who makes the final decisions um, at a rational gets to judge how important the writing is to other things. And so I have an advantage over a lot of other writers. So we are, you know, an unfair advantage, I'd say. Um, I think that, and I've only worked, and I worked at Looking Glass, and I've worked at Rational. Those are the only companies I've worked at. I think that the most important thing for a writer is to be at the studio. And I think the most important thing for a writer is to understand the game very deeply, you know, and to know what they're asking the, of, of other people on the team, to have an understanding of what that is. Because by knowing that, it's not only the right thing to do. It sounds like it's a... Um, it's a nice thing to do for people. No, but no, it's because the, if you can find something that's easier for them to do, that's, it's just as much work for you, or it's, you're gonna get more of what you want, and it's gonna be of a higher quality. The knowing what's easy and what's hard is important to do, and sometimes you're gonna choose the thing that's hard because you need it, but uh, I've been in literally probably hundreds of situations where I've gone back to rewrite because we couldn't execute on something for technical reasons, time reasons, whatever, and almost always it's ended up being something better. Um, that just forces you into another, another draft, and you can't be too precious. You have to be very careful about what you're precious about because rewriting is relatively easy compared to most things in game development. Um, it's just sitting in front of a word processor, you know? So I think you gotta go in with, with, that, with that understanding, but at the end of the day, Nobody understand. I think the thing that you're going to have the hardest time with is that I think a lot of people think writing is done. You write the script, you hand it over to people, and you're done with it. You know, as compared to theater or, or film, where you know you assume there's going to be rehearsals and you're going to hear the lines, you're going to be able to do rewrites on the fly, and you're going to see how it actually looks. Like if I was directing a play, you pretty much see how it looks, and you could really fine tune it. With games, you, you do, I, I would write something in the script, I record it, and then for various reasons, sometimes it wouldn't get in for three or four months. And then it's like, okay, well, there you go, Ken. And I'd be like, oh, no, 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 this is terrible. I've got, it's gotta be redone. And I think people do have a hard time with that because I think they don't understand writing is like anything else. It's like, it has to be bug fit. You know, it has to, you're gonna, get, you're gonna make mistakes. Um, but generally, you, you, the more economical you can be, the better. Does that, uh, does the pain of that process ever tempt you to make games in the Uncharted style where it is kind of more? <laughs> you can kind of plot out your cutscenes and you know what you're going to get. Um, I, I wrote a game, you know, I wrote Tries Vengeance in, in that style of having cutscenes and I don't think it was very good um, because it, it sort of, um, and I think, you know, that's not to say, I'm, I think the Uncharted guys are really good. I think they do what they do really well. I don't know if I would do it that well because I think that I am, I, I don't like watching cutscenes. I skip cutscenes for the most part. I'm very impatient when I'm gaming. I want a game. And I think that that's why I like System Shock um, 1 so much, because it, I never asked me to sit back and watch. And so I don't, I don't really want to do that. It, it's, it's hard, but I find it very, very rewarding. Yeah, that's good. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
James, I'm a master student at Goldsmiths. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any advice for any uh, aspiring game designers. I got, look, the problem is I got such a break that it's kind of hard, I, I'm serious, like, I, I do not know how I got the break I got. Like, and if, if somebody came to me now and they said, hey Ken, I've never designed a game before, I have no experience, why don't I be your wingman on what you're doing next? <coughs> I'd probably look at them like they were insane. And I really don't know how I got so lucky because I didn't really have any business being there. So I'm a really bad person to ask. And I'm grateful every day for how lucky I got. I think, you know, but that said, I think the most important thing to do as a game designer, the worst thing you can do, and you probably, I'm not saying you would do this. I, I got a letter from a lawyer recently, a lawyer. And he said, hi, Mr. Hi, Kevin Levin, um, which I get a lot. Uh, I get all the time. Um, especially people who wanted to do business with me. They, um, he says, I have an idea for a game, and I am willing to share profits with you on this if your team develops it. And I thought that was sexy. Um, <laughs> um, you know, basically, um, for those of you who are offended by bad words, I'm about to use one to cover your ears. Ideas are fucking worthless. Um, ideas without execution don't have any value. So I've never had an idea that I thought was so dynamite. It had to happen, and it didn't matter what came next. Ideas are, are, are meant to be a starting point. And so when somebody comes from the outside and they say they want to have, you know, they want to share ideas with me, that's the last thing I want to hear. What gets me excited when I see a young guy come in is they want to learn about development. Like a lot of great people come from QA, internal studio QA, now publishing QA because you're much closer to the, to, the, to the meat of what's happening. We've hired a lot of people from QA um, to do more senior roles. Um, a desire to understand the unfun parts, you know? You know, what it's like to fix bugs and what it's like to track things in databases and what it's like to, um, to watch, you know, f focus testing and take notes on it and all that stuff. It's, it, you have to have a passion for the process or before you can do anything else. Um, when I went to Looking Glass, you know, I'll say that I got very lucky, but I also say that I made it my business. Doug Church was a, is a genius, but it also is a bit of an odd duck. He would come into work sometimes at midnight and I would wait. I'd come into work at 11 or 10 in the morning, whatever it was, and I'd wait for Doug to show up just so I can get an hour with him and learn from him because I knew the opportunity. I knew what it was and, you know, we have, sometimes you have people come into the studio and they're, you know, they kind of feel that, um, you know, without demonstrating anything that they should, you know, they deserve to have their ideas put into place. And it, it is such a, um, there's so many people with ideas. It's the people who sit down and actually make things happen that are always the most impressive. And I've got guys, I've got really junior guys who I see do stuff. and. I, I can just tell by the dedication they put even to the, the stupidest, the, the most banal task, if they put dedication to that, I know they're gonna be a good developer. And that, I will trust them with things because they've shown that dedication. Because what game ta making games takes is coming into work, and on every game I've ever worked on, I've had this day, where you come and you go, oh my God, we are so fucked. This game is never gonna get done. <laughs> and you know what? That is the most useless feeling to have and the most useless opinion because you still got to, what, what does that do for you? You come in and you make it and you make it happen. And every game I've worked on, from System Shock 2 to Bioshock to Bioshock Infinite, has had the darkest of days. And uh, the people who, if you can't come into work and say, what can I do to make this better, then you really don't have a place in game development. That sounded like I was berating you for something, but I wasn't. <laughs> um, but you know, pa passion and, 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 a, and a desire to learn the craft is really important. And then talent, of course, I mean talent. But I tell you, you've ta if you have talent and you don't have stick to itiveness, it's irrelevant, your talent's irrelevant. A couple more? I mean, one more. I, 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 I mean, it's up to you, I can. Uh, no, I'm in no hurry, so. Um, 
uh, names as, just some guy. Um, <laughs> uh, considering your background in a film, or more t to the point in script line, if, say, a lawyer came along from Paramount, for example, or, I don't know, Universal Studios, and they said, hi, we want to be able to option Bioshock for a film adaptation, how would you go about translating your game vision to the big screen at the same time? Who would you like to get involved? Um, well, well, that happened with Bioshock. Um, um, you know, we, there was a deal in place and actually was in production at, 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 um, at Universal with Gore Verbinski was directing it. And what happened was, um, and this is, my, 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 this is my, my theory. So Gore, had a, it was a very big movie. Um, if, and it, Gore was very excited about it and he wanted to make a very dark, what he would call a hard R film. Very, you know, hard R. We have, a, I don't know if they have that here. R, in America, an R rating is like the, yeah, yeah you know, you see, yeah, 17, 18 plus. Um, you know, where you can have basically blood and naked girls. Um, and um, I don't think he wanted naked girls. He wanted a lot of blood. Um, and um, then Watchmen came out, and which I actually think is a really, I really like Watchmen, and I've actually talked to Zach, and I think he's a, a great visual filmmaker. And it didn't do well for whatever reason. I think the, studio got cold feet about making a R-rated $200 million film. And they said, well, Gore, what if it was an $80 million film? And enough time had gone by, Gore didn't want to make an $80 million film. And so they brought another director in, and I didn't really see the match there. And so, you know, Take-Two is one of these companies that gives a lot of trust to their, to their creative people. And so they said to me, if you want to kill it, Ken, kill it. And I killed it. Um, which is weird, having been a screenwriter, you know, going around begging for, you know, anything to write, do a rewrite of a script, to then be in a position where you're like, killing a movie of one of your, you know, the thing that you worked so much on. But... Was it, it payback to the scriptwriter? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was saying, you know what, I don't need to compromise. How many times in life do you not, do you not need to compromise? And it comes along so rarely that I felt I didn't need to. I, I had the world, you know, the world existed and the, I didn't want to see it done in a way that I didn't think was right. And it, who know, it may happen someday, who knows, but it would have to be the right combination of, 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 of people. Oh, I'll pick, I think we should get, I, next one should be a woman, I think. I don't think we've had any women oh, asking questions. <laughs> This poor girl, he's putting up her hand. I, I'm Francisco, and I'm currently unemployed. My you say I, you're Disco? No, Francisco. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> disco is not a bad name. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I've had some people call me Disco Cisco for a few years, but uh, yeah, anyway, I'm currently unemployed. My own fault, I did English at university. And uh, basically, I started playing System Shock 2 recently, now it's finally got re released on good old games. And like, I was quite surprised by just like the amount of RPG elements in it. I, I I'm really terrible. I thought that Fallout 3 invented the first-person shooter RPG, and I was just wondering if there was anything from that kind of era that you ever wanted to go back to, or or if like you can't like kind of blockbuster yeah. games kind of satisfy or the creative direction that you've wanted to go in in your career. Um, I think that um, you know. System Shock, oddly, System Shock 2 was really the last game that I um, wrote the like design document on, and we did. I had a lot of people come in and help me, you know, you know, develop that as it went on. And I wrote, you know, I really intended to write an RPG, um, and I think that we, um, I, I wasn't when we made Bioshock. It was it wasn't clear to me whether that was a limiting factor of its success. And I know this is probably frustrating to a lot of, you know, can be frustrating to a lot of gamers, but. You know, if you don't, the, the, the reality is, if you don't, if a game you make doesn't make money, there are no more of those games. And I think the thing, one of the things I'm proudest of and happiest about is that the success of Bioshock is, in it, I think, probably enabled publishers to feel confident about green lighting games, you know, um, you know, games like Dishonored and games like the, you know, the, the, the most recent Deus Ex, which as a gamer, I had, you know, great experiences with. But it's because they have, but they have to make money. Now, I think there are ways 
Now, there weren't a few years ago like Kickstarter and stuff like that where you can make games that are, and you can argue that, the, that those games wouldn't be in a niche, you know, wouldn't fall into a niche. But assuming they are, now there are models where even you can make very, very niche games and still be successful. Um, and because you can appeal to, you have a way to directly connect to a particular audience. But you know, you, it's hard to A-B test whether Bioshock 1 would have been more successful with a, you know, a, a deeper RPG system. I'd, I'd say that probably Infinite has a deeper RPG system than, I think we actually gained some confidence there. It has a deeper system. I wouldn't say it compares to, you know, um, you know, it wouldn't compare to World of Warcraft or anything by any stretch of the imagination in terms of the depth of systems. But, um, you know, somebody also once said that Bio System Shock 2 was a game about running from combat, not, not, it wasn't about combat, it was about running from combat, which I think is also kind of true. And generally, it's, you know, in that way, it really is a survival horror game in a lot of ways. And you don't really see those games getting made a lot either anymore. But they do, like, like Dark Souls is a good example of a game that has sort of a similar vibe. And that is, you know, it's a popular title, but to a, you can't make a, X million dollar game and sell as many units as Dark Souls does and survive. So it's all these trade-offs is you want to make this big narrative experience and that it's not cheap to make, but you, there's a commercial reality to that. Um, so we, it's always a trade-off and it's always a balance and it's very easy for me to poo-poo like, oh, RPG stuff, because I, I love RPG stuff. Like the games I play are very systemic. My favorite games like Master of Magic and, and Civilization and um, you know, I play a lot of turn-based games. I play, you know, I love, Di I love, I love, you know, Diablo and like games where I can really min-max. But I chose at the end of the day storytelling um, as more important than RPG. And that's not to say we don't have RPG, but I had to choose one over the other. And storytelling is very expensive, and um, we have to sell a certain number of units to be successful. Hi, I'm Sarah, I'm in community management. Um, it's kind of a similar question. You spoke out um, a couple of months ago about the box art for Bioshock Infinite, and you were really honest about it, which was great, about creating a box art that would be commercially accessible to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. How do you find that push and pull between keeping your creative integrity as a game designer and director whilst creating a game that would be commercially successful? Because I know a lot of games struggle with that balance. I mean, Bioshock is an amazing game, but you probably wouldn't look back and go, oh, I'm super happy with the units that sold. How would you keep that kind of creative yep. commercial balance? Well, here's the difference between a box art and a game. You can actually take a piece of box art and put it in front of 2,000 people and actually get feedback from them. Well, you can't really do that with a game, and I wouldn't do that with a game. And you can do it before it's too late. You can do like eight or nine pieces of box art and take it through a period of testing, and you actually get some reasonably objective data. A, you can't do that with a game, and B, we've never done that with a game. If you put, like as I said, you know, we make games that involve objectivism and, 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 infanti and, and infanticide and religion and racism. These are not games with that compromise, make compromises. We don't make compromises in our themes. We don't make compromises in our games, we make the game that I think is right. You know, when we talked about RPG before, I felt the narrative experience, and I look back on System Shock 2 and I try to decide what I thought we really brought to the table, more importantly, was I thought the, the sort of immersing you in the world in a narrative sense was the most important thing, and that's why we had so much of a focus on it in Bioshock. But we don't make, we basically don't make compromises on the game. And it, it was frustrating to have that reaction to the cover because I remember there was an article in Kotaku that said like, um, oh, you know, what this says about the game. And the truth is it didn't say shit about the game. Um, and, you know, it said a lot about our, our, turns out when you put a box with a flag, a burning flag and a guy with a gun on it in front of 3,000 people, they, they like that, you know. Um, <laughs> If you put it in front of, you know, the readers of, you know, I'm a hardcore gamer, you put it in front of a reader, the readership of a hardcore gaming site, they're going to be really, they're going to hate it. And is it my favorite cover? No, I think you've seen some key art around, you know, that we've had like some, like if you look at, we just released some art, like this great piece of art we call the falling art, which is on a building in Los Angeles, which I love and I, you know, was very heavily involved with. But that's sort of a supplemental piece. If you look at the, the what we call the key art with Booker and Elizabeth, 
you know, this really nice pose. Um, I love that piece of art. But a box cover is this big. It's much smaller than a movie poster. So we had to make a choice. And look, and we try to make good with the gamers in terms of um, you know, the, the alternate box covers and stuff. But it does worry me that we are setting ourselves up to, yeah, I think of the flight simulator field, which I used to, you know, I used to, flight simulators used to be really popular, like Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe and other games like that. And they were fun and they were kind of goofy and X-Wing versus TIE Fighter. And then the flight sim guys got, said, no, 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 that's not a flight sim. A flight sim has to have this, 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 and this feature, and I'm not gonna buy your goddamn stupid flight sim, and you're a sellout. And I worry that, and now, you know, flight sims are where they are in terms of, in terms of their audience. And same with console games. I remember, you know, when first console games came out, everybody thought that that was the end of gaming, you know, and the, all the great PC game developers went over and made some really great console games, um, really amazing console games, and they were cross-platform. And, it, and those games never would have appeared on the PC from an economic standpoint if they didn't, if the consoles didn't exist. And it is a, you know, we, you can, you can hug the baby so tightly that it dies. And it worries me a little bit as a person who actually looks at like employing people and making sure that I make payroll. Because I have a great thing, I think I'm proudest of it, Irrational, is when it was a private company, we made payroll every month. And we did that by having to make some, make some games that I had to make compromises there. Like when I had to, uh, you know, was Tribes of Vengeance the game I really wanted to make? No, but it, it, paid, it made payroll and it got us to the place where we can make Bioshock. Fortunately, we're in the place now where we don't have to make any compromises on the games we make in terms of, in terms of the games. But if I have to compromise on a cover, I'll compromise on that cover. If, if this is correct, one of these is correct at the beginning. Uh, like this, this fun, it's the end now. <laughs> I know. This is the last one. Uh, okay. <laughs> let's see, let's hope it's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, make it no good, pressure. Um, so, one of my favorite things about Bioshock 1 was uh, that as a gamer, I felt like it always treated me as an adult. Uh, not so much because of like the violence or the horror elements, but because of the story and the themes behind it and the choices that it made you think about. Um, why do you think so few other games sort of try to connect with their player on that level? Well, it's, I mean, it, I don't like, I don't wake up in the morning and say like, Oh, uh, you know, my, today I really want to elevate the industry. You know, like that's, <laughs> that's the last thing that would ever go through my mind. I, I have a set of interests and people on my team have a set of interests. And we make things that reflect our interests. You know, if I had to make a football game, I would be com hopelessly outclassed because I had, I'm not interested in that. I happen to like a set of things that seems like you also like. Um, and I also have always thought that gamers were, because um, I know gamers, you know, I know gamers, that they um, are smarter than they're given credit for. Um, and I'm not, I don't mean that, like, I, was, I hate when people say, like, you know, kids are smart. No, because not all kids are smart. A lot of kids are dumb. You know, that is just the way it is. Some kids are smart, some kids are dumb. But gamers generally often come as they're smart, nerdy kids who are outsiders, who didn't have social lives, who found solace in this world. So you tend to have a lot of very smart people in video gaming. And, and that's, as it's getting more mass market, that's, it's getting a little more diffuse, but still you have a lot of very smart people um, who like games. Um, and so, but I, I don't, we don't have a mission to like elevate gaming, and I'm not saying we are elevating it. We have, we have a mission to make stuff that we think is cool. And I think everybody else is doing the same thing. I think they're just making what they think is cool. And people just have different influences. But you have like, why were so many games when gaming started about science fiction and fantasy? It's because the outsiders were making them, right? And those guys tended to be interested in science fiction and fantasy. So by chance, by, by, you know, not by chance, but for that reason, games tended to be about science fiction and fantasy. I was always interested in science fiction and fantasy, but I also, you know, I you know, got my fortune and my parents sent me to a nice liberal arts school and I got to read a lot of things that bored me at the time that became more interesting to me later. And, um, you know, so we made games about a broader range of topics, but still, you know, it's still got cool robots and monsters in it, so I get to have the best of both worlds. Cool, well, 
thank you so much for your time. Thank you. For being so generous with it. And I hope you get a good rest soon, because <laughs> it's well deserved. And we all can't wait to play your video game. So, yeah. Can't wait to hear what you guys think. Okay. Let's, thank you, uh, everybody.